everyone, Adam here. Welcome to Musky Town's Tying with the Pros Fly Tying video series. On this first episode, we are going to focus on one of the staple patterns in musky and predator fly fishing. Um, it's a great musky pattern. I had my first back-to-back uh, -back muskies on this pattern this past fall. Um, I've also cost, uh, caught really, really big pike and bass, both smallmouth and largemouth with this pattern. So uh, it's a great place to start because a lot of the techniques that we'll talk about over the course of this series extend beyond just this pattern tonight. Uh, and if you do have any questions after we go through or if we rush over anything that you are looking for more information on, shoot us a note through social or send us an email, give us a call, happy to talk through stuff. So before we dive in, we're going to do a quick materials run through. Uh, for this pattern, you are going to need bucktail. Uh, length is not the most important part of this pattern. However, um, I am very, very picky about my bucktails and you are looking for something that has really fine tips. It has good crinkle, and I'm gonna try to bring that close. You can see it's got that nice wave. Um, and then you're looking for something that has a little bit of hollow in the, the bases. And the reason for that is when you tie in, um, that is part of what we use to control the taper. Uh, and, and we'll get a little bit more into that. But bucktail is one of the first things you need. The next is feathers. Um, we've got a couple different versions of feathers here. Uh, we use the whiting schlop in bundles. Uh, again, length is not the biggest deal. You don't need the 10 to 14 always. Uh, the 6 to 10 are our most used uh, feathers. And the reason I like the 6 to 10 inch is because they're a little bit wider and they help you build that profile. If you have, you know, a, a saddle or something like that, you can definitely use feathers from a saddle. Uh, so feathers and then flash. Uh, I like the polar flash from, uh, I think Hedon makes this. Yeah, uh, Hedron makes this, pardon me. And uh, whether you're using uh, polar flash or something, you know, like holographic flash of boo or, or some other flash that you like to use, um, there's really no wrong answers there. Uh, in addition to flash, we are tying on gamakatsu round bend 60 degree hooks. Uh, one of my favorite hooks, uh, these ride hook point up in the water, especially once we add weight. And to add weight, we are using the hairline uh, pseudo XL eyes, uh, P-S-E-U-D-O. Um, and we offer all of these, we'll include a materials list here too. So if we ran through that quickly, uh, don't worry about it. You'll be able to, to pick it up in text. Um, but yeah, what am I leaving out? Oh, and the only other thing you're going to need uh, for this pattern is uh, I like the extra select uh, marabou from hairline and... Uh, I don't think I'm leaving anything else uh, out except for thread, which uh, Flymaster Plus 210 flat waxed. Uh, there's a bunch of options you have here if you're somebody who likes to tie with, you know, uni thread or if you like, you know, Vivas power thread or something like that. Uh, you definitely have some options uh, and a lot of that becomes personal preference. You'll notice me spinning my thread a lot as we go through, and that's because this is a flat wax thread. Uh, when it is flat, it's much weaker because you're pulling on the individual fibers of the thread. Um, twisted, this is a very strong thread, and uh, yeah. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in. Get that out of the way for you. So we're going to start with a thread base, and we just go ahead and put our thread on and we wrap. And we'll go all the way back to the bend of the hook. If you go a little bit too far, that's okay. Uh, you can just kind of advance your thread and we'll start elsewhere. But we wrap our thread all the way back to the bends, all the way forward to the eye. Um, if your thread is flat, that's okay, but it's really not ideal. Uh, uh, one of the other reasons that we spin our thread like this is because when you wrap that on the shank, it creates these little ridges. And I don't know if you can hear that on the video, but when you cinch materials down on those ridges, it really locks them down as opposed to if you were tying on a bare shank, in which case, you know, or, you know, flat thread, in which case things would slide. So um, I'll usually I'll start my thread dam near the eye, work my way back, back to the eye, and then back to the bend of the hook before we start tying. And when we get there, uh, I usually like to work from light to dark uh, for a fly. I and mean, if you ever notice with fish that, you know, a lot of them will have like white bellies and they'll have kind of a dark part on the front of the head. Um, that's my own personal preference and by no means a hard and fast rule. Uh, Sully is one of our tires. And, and if you notice when Sully ties, he's got a ton of different color uses for contrast. Uh, and, you know, there's really no... 100% right answer in terms of, of, you know, color combos. 
So one of our first steps is we'll start with a nice little clump of bucktail and nice little clump if you're using a, a regular pencil as your example. And it's a good reference point. When you compress this hair, you're really looking to have about a quarter to a, a half a pencil thickness when you start. And I'm, I'm holding the material tight and I'm brushing out these under fair, under furs uh, and I'm flicking them out. And the reason for that is it just helps you make sure that you're getting a good bond to the hook shank when you do start tying materials in. I won't use this white again. So the first step here is going to be spinning bucktail around the shank. And what we do, if you notice, I have about eh, between an eighth and a quarter inch of tag in the bucktail. And these first couple wraps are going to be really, really light. No pressure. If, I, if you'll notice, I, I'm just going to let that go. Like I can wiggle that back and forth and it's not really locked down. Um, and the reason for that is because now that I got two loose wraps, what I'll do is I'll slowly push down on the material, which helps distribute that fiber around the hook shank, and then I'll start to spin it. And if you notice, after I do that first spin, and I'll count wraps here in a second, it wraps all the way around the shank and gives us good even coverage. And what I'll usually do is five wraps, six wraps, uh, you know, it, there's no hard and fast rules there. Uh, and in terms of technique, you're not necessarily just wrapping your thread around the same place. Um, if, if this is the end of my bobbin and this is the hook shank, what I'll usually do is I'll do the first wrap there and then I'll go back across it on the second wrap. And then I'll actually go back towards the rear of the first tie in and cover that up with a third. You're usually pretty locked in after those first three wraps, but then after that, you'll go ahead and kind of keep crossing for the next two to three wraps and then you're good there. So everything's gonna be pretty tied in tight. Uh, you don't want material here, the bucktail that's too hollow in the bases, because if you use that for this first step, what will end up happening is your, your material will flare so much that you don't have the same control over the taper that you want. Uh, so with that, you'll notice we have these ends kind of, I kind of pull them back and they get a little flat. What I do is you'll capture a little, about maybe a third of that ta protruding tag end at a time and, and lock it in. And then you kind of keep pushing it back get about half of what is left there. And you know, there's no hard and fast rules. If you wanna do like quarters, whatever, like don't worry about that. Um, and then we go ahead and lock in our last little bit of that material. And so what ends up happening is, especially on the tail of a fly like this, you know, pike especially are really hard on flies. Uh, a lot of the fisheries we fish for these have both pike and muskies and they, um, they're hard on flies. So I'll very much err toward over building things. I, I use a lot of super glue, don't have to do it. It's okay if you don't want to, uh, but yeah. So after that first tie-in, we'll move our, our, we'll advance our thread just a little bit. Um, after that first tie-in, we're actually gonna flip everything upside down. So I, I'm gonna just make this a little easier. And I, I have a rotary vise. I'm using a, a Dyna King Barracuda vise here but you have a ton of different vice options in today's world uh, and they're all really good. So, you know, there, there are incremental improvements for different vices if, you know, if you need them or want them. But, you know, for instance, some of our, our tires tie on vices like the Barracuda or one of the, you know, a, a top end Dyna King. We have other tires that really like to tie. Uh, one of our guys ties on an entry level uh, HMH vice and has been for a couple decades. So, uh, there's really, you can start wherever you want to, and you can always, you know, trade later if you want, but, um, you don't have to, and, and that's okay. So this fly is going to end up being right around eight inches. So you notice our tail, um, tie in of the bucktail goes to there. Um, I generally have a pretty good sense and I tie a lot of these, uh, for what the different lengths at different marks on my vice are for different hooks. But, uh, first step here is our bucktail. Some tires will do their flash next, and there are patterns that use, you know, purely flash as the tail in place of feathers. This is not one of those patterns. So what, I'll, what I would like to do, uh, usually on this type of fly, is I mark out the length that I want my feathers to be, and, and you'll notice that these feathers are a little bit longer than, you know, maybe we want our pattern to be. And being careful, you're not just grabbing the stem and pulling because you can pop the stem, especially as some get a little weaker. But you're grabbing those fiber fibers and you're stripping them off. And yeah, you'll see I go back to measuring a lot. And, and I'm going to really take our time on this, get it exactly where we want it. If your goal is to tie really fast and pound these out, you can do that. 
and they'll probably fish really well. Um, if your goal is to uh, just tie maybe a, a fly after work or, you know, after a long day and that's your kind of relaxed time, take as much time as you want uh, and, and you'll be equally happy just depending on what it is you're, you're going for. So whereas with our bucktail, we started with a loose tie-in and then, you know, tightened and spun with our feathers, we really want these feathers to stick exactly where we put them. So I'm going pretty tight here. Um, and you'll notice I go back across that first wrap, keep our fibers from the tail out of the way, and then forward again, back across the front. And I'll usually just do uh, three wraps as I'm getting feathers where we want them for a pattern. And then, you know, when I do three wraps on the other side, um, and then a couple more, everything's good and locked in. And naturally, I'm going to do super glue too. And if you're doing a bunch of these, you can definitely prepare your materials in advance, you know, to get everything consistent. And, you know, that'd be production tying. Um, if you're just going to be tying one or two and you want to enjoy, you know, each stage of it, you can do that too. So yeah, I'm letting my materials clip back a little bit here. If your vice doesn't have a materials clip like that on it, um, these little, I want to say they're three quarters inch hair clips are great. Um, I'll often use both, especially for articulated patterns if I'm trying to control a, a rear shank. But for the sake of this one, we'll just go ahead and pin those feathers in there. And if you wanted, you could do a couple different sets of tail feathers. Uh, on this pattern, I, we're going to have... Uh, three sets of feathers plus a pectoral uh, set, but uh, right now we're just going to go ahead and clip off the tag ends on the tail. There are times where I will, like on a red horse pattern, for instance, uh, I'll actually put in two sets of first tail uh, feathers, and if that's something you want to do, you can. Uh, if you have feathers that are, you know, maybe a little limp or thin and they're not necessarily what you would, they don't necessarily give you the desired effect. There's definitely nothing wrong with putting a few different layers in. So I just put super glue on and we'll probably speed this up as, you know, when we share it for everyone. Um, I don't use a ton of flash. So, you know, if we were using, let's just do it for instance, if we were doing a flash tail fly and we do another one of those with, uh, with Justin Hokinson, he's one of our pro staffers, but if we're doing a flash tail fly, you know, you might want to grab 30, 40 fibers. Uh, but for this pattern, less is more. And, and that's something you'll notice is that you don't need a ton of flash to achieve the desired effect. And I'm using, let's call it 10 fibers max on the tail here. Uh, and this is because we're tying a sucker and the purpose of this pattern is going to be something that I use, uh, excuse me, something that I would use in scenarios, you know, where the water is ultra clear, or maybe there's a ton of different bait and we don't want to deviate too much from, you know, the predominant forage in a fishery. Um, but the next step, when I pull my, my flash out, I, I, when I first cut it, everything's even, and I'm trying to bring that up. But what I'll do is I'll go ahead and tease out the, the fibers to build taper. Um, this is something that I like to do. It's something that you don't have to do if you don't want to. But uh, I, what I've noticed is I feel like I get a much more natural effect in the water. Um, and, and again, that's what I'm going for on this one. So after we measure out our flash like we just did, um, I measure out with my fingers and I keep track of that and I fold my flash with the long end one way and then that way I can actually bring my thread just like that over the top of it. And I'll do a couple wraps and they're tight but they're not so tight that the material won't move and the reason for that is I use my finger to if this is the hook shank to kind of distribute that flash over the top of the shank like that. And when I get it where I want, um, Polar flash kind of separates. If, if I just were to rip my bodkin through it, I, there's a chance that, you know, maybe I would curl some of that flash. And, and that's not something I want to do. Uh, but the goal is just to get nice, 
um, even coverage over those feathers in the rear of the fly. Now, once I get it where I want it, I'll go ahead and give it a couple extra wraps to really lock everything in. Um, I don't know if you heard that ping, but I just clipped my thread around the uh, hook eye, which happens sometimes. And sometimes you'll cut your thread. And when that happens, just wrap right over the top of it. And most of the time, you're going to be just fine to keep advancing. There are times when, you know, you might have to redo a step or something like that. And that's completely okay. So just a quick recap, we did our, our bucktail, then our feathers, then our flash uh, swing thought for building the taper on a single, which is different than building the taper on uh, an articulated fly. On a single, I'll typically start with my longest bucktail tie-in first, and then slowly get shorter and build out that belly shape and that, that teardrop fusiform profile uh, that gives you the action that you're going for, but also the profile that you're going for. This is a pattern that in some scenarios, you're going to, you may be fishing it very slowly and yes, it'll jig, but you know, it's kind of gives you that dying bait fish, uh, effect. And, you know, when I first started tying these, you know, sometimes all my bucktail was the same length and if they fished fine, like if that's what you do, go fish the thing, the fish will tell you if they like it or not. Um, but as I have advanced as a tire and, you know, gotten feedback from fish, you definitely will notice more eats if you take that extra step to build your taper as you tie a fly. So again, with a single, start long and kind of work your way shorter and open your bucktail taper with reverse ties as you go forward. If I was tying an articulated fly, um, I may start with, you know, really short bucktail on the back, one and a half, two, two and a half inches, and then increase the length of the bucktail up until maybe the two thirds to three quarters point in the fly, and then shorten and taper back down to get that same bait fish profile. And we'll reiterate a lot of this stuff in different videos, but um, really understanding how to build a taper uh, with a, a, a large predator fly, I, I think is really important. And uh, I think it's worth the extra time to do it. So bucktail, feathers, flash. I won't do flash in that sequence every time. I usually just do flash every third tie-in or so. Um, Sully taught me that. And I really like to mix up, uh, I like to mix up the color of bucktail that I am tying with in the pattern. And, and I don't have quite as much material on a clump that I had tied from a different fly. But if I started with a, quarter to a half a pencil on the first tie-in. Um, for this next tie-in, I am after um, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, a half to two thirds of a pencil. And you'll get a feel for how much material you want a, a fly to have. You know, if you're fishing in really turbulent conditions, you're going to want a pattern that has a lot of material because, you know, you want to make sure they see it. Uh, and you know, that differs from if you're fishing in, say, like, you know, bluebird skies and the water's calm, you know, you're going to use a little bit less flash in that situation. And you're going to use a little bit more material to kind of get that uh, elusive bait fish effect. Uh, so, yeah, if you have any questions on that type of stuff, you know, when you might fish different patterns or, or anything like that, uh, definitely let us know. Now, I got a little bit longer bucktail here than what I would consider ideal. Uh, and one option, you can, you can certainly cut the bucktail and show you how much material you'll be cutting off. And it wouldn't necessarily hurt things for a fly. Uh, and actually let's, we can do that. It, there, there are scenarios where, you know, say the hollow, I'm gonna hold this at the, the fine ends, but say the hollow of your fly ended right here. And in some tails it will. I wouldn't wanna cut that off because the way that that material would behave in the water wouldn't necessarily hold the profile. It might not move like I like. Uh, specifically for muskies, uh, they like flies that hold a profile. So uh, when I first started tying, it was too much material on the shank uh, and that that's okay. Uh, as I progressed, I'd start to use maybe a little bit too little material on the shank and, and they're easier to cast and they swim well but you know, underwater, maybe that profile wasn't exactly what I was going for. So now I've kind of swung back to using more material on the shank 
um, to hold profile, but that, you know, there's a sweet spot between not too much or not too little. So this has about that, that half a buck, uh, half a pencil or so of bucktail. And what I'll do is I will measure on my side, I'll do it on this side so you can see. Now I want this one to be a little shorter at the tie-in than my previous tie-in as we, we work towards the belly. And there will be three or four bucktail tie-ins on this. Um, usually I'll do four to five on a five odd hook, three to four on a four odd hook, depending on the amount of material. But as we, we find our measurement spot, we say, okay, I want it to be this long and I know how long I want to kind of stick out. This is pretty hollow material a ways up the butt of the tail. So I'm not going to do any damage by cutting this. But there are tails where I would be. And just wanted to mention that because, you know, it, it does depend what kind of tail you have. It does depend what kind of tail you have versus what you're trying to accomplish with it. And so I'm going to speak in a lot of generalizations and so are our tires over this is what I do in this situation. This is what I recommend. And for some of those techniques, if you have a different way, that's fine. Uh, for others, if you have a different technique, why you do that is what, you know, what matters. And, and I'll use an example here when we do our, our first reverse tie in in a moment. So uh, again, on this fly. I'm going to do the first two tie-ins regular without reverse tying, and that'll make more sense in a second. So, you know, just like we did on the first tie-in, and I, you'll notice I flip my hook over. That's just to get the hook point out of the way. Um, you hold your material there. You do, and I, I spin my thread here because, you know, if my thread is flat when I do this loose part and then I go to pull it, you'll break your thread, and it will happen. So don't worry about it when it does. But do my loose wrap two loose wraps. Uh, I know some tires do three loose wraps, but then I like to kind of push down while I spin around. And the, what that does is that helps kind of that, that clump of material kind of settle in around the hook shank as the thread spins. And you'll notice that, you know, the, the hook point kind of gets in the way of that spinning all the way around sometimes. Uh, and, and that's just a symptom of, of the jig hook and, and that's nothing wrong with that. So sometimes you got to, you know, help it around a little bit, uh, but your goal is nice, even coverage around the shank. So we got our tail there and I got a little bit stuck on this side of the hook point and that's fine. We'll just put our bodkin in there and, and good to go. And just like we did before, uh, I will push that, you know, those butt ends back and I'll capture a third or so of them. And you'll see me winding my thread, kind of wiggling it back and forth. Uh, the reason for that is I am attempting to lock um, those butt ends in like we talked about, but if I didn't do that, what would happen is the, the maybe one of the butt ends would wrap around too, and that just affects the bond of the shank. Uh, if you're tying a bunch of these for your own box, then don't worry about it. Just do it and fish it, and you know if it falls apart, you can, you can tie another one. Uh, some of these, you know, we're sending, you know, as far as Australia, all the way around the other side of the world. And I want to know that if we have a customer that catches a Murray cod with it, that it's going to last for multiple fish. Um, same thing for muskies. Uh, same thing for pike, ideally, although pike are really, really hard on flies. So um, I, I think that's part of why I overbuild so many is because I did a lot of pike fishing on, on my journey towards, towards musky. And um, I, you know, when you have a hot fly, you want that thing to work. Uh, and, you know, it, if it catches one fish, it's done its job. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's, there's plenty of flies you'll tie that, that don't catch a fish, but there's something to be said for a fly that becomes increasingly fishy as you fish it. Uh, this fly is an example and it's really similar to the one that we're tying here, but back-to-back um, -back muskies on back-to-back -back cast this last fall on this fly. And it's pretty rough now. I think we caught a few pike right after that and it started falling apart shortly after. Super glued it for another day or two, caught a couple more muskies on it. But you know, some flies just have mojo and, and usually it's the one you stay up until two in the morning the night before a fishing trip to tie. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason for it. That's just the way it is. So we did our second tie-in of bucktail. 
Uh, you notice on the first time we used our light color feathers on this next one, we actually do the same way that we go longer bucktail, shorter, shorter, and work our way up. Um, with feathers, we start with our longest and we work our way and we're kind of filling in that dead space on the taper. Um, if all your feathers line up, that's fine. Like it may fish just fine. Um, but again, if we're taking the extra time to try and, and tie a fly a certain way, um, I very much will take the extra steps to attempt to get uh, everything and anything out of it. And I'm just going to just think about something in one sec. So I was thinking about contrast. Uh, I have uh, some Cree uh, kind of bar ginger Cree somewhere between grizzly and bar ginger feathers there. And I'm going to have those go over the very top of the fly just to add complexity. And I'm going to work my way up, not quite a third shorter. I would say this is 10 to 15% shorter than the, the first feather tie-in. And that's being overly precise. Uh, I Some of my first ones, the first, the second feather set was two thirds as long. And then the last set was, you know, half again as long as that one. Uh, and in building taper, you, you're gonna find what works for you. This is just what's worked well for me. So another technique that I really like as you strip stems of feathers, this stem is flat like this. So I'm gonna tent these feathers, which means that I'm gonna put them at an angle across the hook. Let me try to see if I can display that. I'm the first tail feathers. If this is the hook shank, I will actually tie straight on the sides. And if my stems are flat to that, that's great. But as I move forward on the fly, I will actually tent the feathers where I'm tying them in across because it builds out width in the fly. So I've measured again, I have my length. Um, I'll take a pair of scissors and there's this flat part in the base of the scissor between the grips. And you just go ahead and pinch that and square it off tight. And I'll, I'll turn my vise so you can see what tenting those feathers looks like again. And so if you'll notice the angle of that feather, it comes all the way across and you see that helps me build the illusion of, of width and bulk in the fly. And in the water, that's all gonna streamline, but um, even then you're still gonna have more uh, depth to the fly than you would have otherwise. You do the same thing on the other side. And we tent this set of feathers too. Get, get it at the angle you want, go nice and tight, keep that tension. And I've noticed I've got some of the, the, the webby fluff trying to get in the way of my thread wraps. I know plenty of tires who don't care and they just keep tying over the top of it and their flies are plenty durable that way. Um, my personal preference is to get that stuff out of the way um, and just to kind of give you an example, see if we can get gravity out of the way. We're tenting those feathers on the shank at an angle. And after we do that, we'll go ahead and bring our scissors in. And we'll snip those stems nice and tight to where we tied in. And again, I'm gonna go ahead and bring my super glue in and I'll just put it right where the thread meets the feather. I'll do that on both sides. Um, there's times where if I know there's a bunch of pike, I will be very particular about how much super glue I use. I'll make sure that it's on the outside, on the inside. Um, but again, you really don't even need the super glue as much. That's just something that I've gotten in the habit of doing uh, in building durability for a fly. And as I advance here, so I went white and tan. I'm probably going to go brown in this next one. If I, I'm keeping pretty even spacing as I move my way forward, if for instance I wasn't, say I did, you know, my first two tie ins had a little more space to the next one, or maybe I had more space. There, there's different instances. Maybe I was a little short next to the hook eye and I wanted to 
make up some ground. I might go a little further on the next time, but I would use more material so that my bulk is being built, you know, increasingly dense toward the front of the fly. And that is the thing that makes your fly, you know, hit the water and have to pick a direction uh, when you're fishing it. So So I know where I'm going to want my next tie in here. We are going to do a brown marabou collar on this. And I'm only bringing this up now because keeping track of your spacing as you work your way up the shank, it's very helpful. Um, if you don't do it, you'll inevitably, and, and even if you're paying attention, there's times where you just, you, you know, your mind's wandering to avoid running out of space at the end of a fly. Um, just being cognizant of how much space on the shank each tie in is taking, it, it'll benefit you. So I'm going to go, you know, if I went half, half inch, quarter to half an inch, then half quarter to half a pencil, then half to two thirds a pencil on the first two tie-ins. Uh, and maybe it was a little more than a half on the second. I wouldn't say it was two thirds a pencil. I'm going to go about two thirds a pencil. And on this fly, on a four uh, hook, this will probably be my last tie-in of bucktail before uh, we do our mar our eyes and then our marabou collar. Um, so like I just talked about, and th this is a, a great example. If I tie this one in here, I'm going to be close to having enough room to do another. Um, you know, I do think I have the room on this shank and, and you'll get a feel for this to do one more tie-in. So I, I think I am going to just go here and I'm measuring and then I decide, okay, I've got my length. I know how much butt end I want to stick out. And again, I, I, I'm picking tails here that have hollow that extends up them. So they're still going to behave and hold the profile like I want them to. Um, so this, this next step, this is a really important step uh, of any pattern and especially of big, uh, large profile predator flies. Uh, Bob Popovics is one of the primary contributors to big fly craft. Uh, he, he's a guy who comes from striper background. Heard he's, you know, one of the nicest guys out there. And his books, he has a number of them. Um, and Pop Flays is one. Uh, and, and we'll pull up a list of some of his other offerings. But uh, he talks about proper hollow fly and reverse tying technique and a number of his books and, and I've seen some videos uh, in the past where he talks about this too, but I've seen a few recent videos from other tires that talk about reverse tying. And they say, you know, I get a lot of questions about how I reverse tie and they, they do this next part where they spin it in a reverse and we'll do this in a second, but then they tie back on top of the bucktail and it's really fast to tie that way. Like if you're pumping out a volume of flies, then yeah, you're going to be really fast because you're not really worrying about controlling the taper, but if you are taking the time to build a profile and a taper in a certain way, um, this is one of those few spots where I believe there is a right way and a wrong way um, in, in you know achieving what you're going for profile wise. So um, we'll show you uh, what that looks like. So spin our thread, make sure it's nice and strong. And we do our first two loose wraps. And notice we're tying in reverse this time. And then we spin our bucktail and it spins all the way around for us. We get nice, even coverage all the way around that. Sometimes it, it, you know, won't behave perfectly, but this one made me happy. And the way I usually do this pattern is I usually just use my fingers to get around the jig hook. Um, but I just recently started using, a, it's called a Proto John and it's got a little groove in one of the sides and it's just like a hollowed out pen, except for it lets you get the, the jig hook eye out of the way, which is just really nice. Um, makes it a little bit easier to, to get a hold of your bucktail and to make sure things aren't just going every which way. And, if you don't have a tool like that, or, you know, you just want to use your fingers and 
I know plenty of tires that just like to use their fingers because there's something about that that makes them happy. You don't need a tool. You don't even need a hollowed pen. But if you want it, um, it, it in my opinion, it, it, it's something that you'll enjoy using. Like everything just kind of becomes a question of efficiency. And, you know, some people are really efficient using their fingers. Other people want to have a tool. Um, but you'll notice I'm not tying over this material. Like if I let it go, it gets big again. Um, you're building up a triangle thread and you're working your way back and forth while you do that because I'll show you as we build up this thread dam. And if you try to all tie in the same place, what will end up happening is this flat thread will separate and it'll roll off and you'll have a hard time getting it to act just like you want. Um, but I'm just gonna give you an example here again in a sec. So you'll notice as I build that thread dam, it's just getting a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter. It's not quite where we want it yet. You know, sometimes it takes a second to build up that dam in the way that you want. And um, I, I know some folks who will, you know, they'll break their thread a few times and they'll say, oh, well, I don't break, break GSP. You know, maybe I like to tie with gel spun. And you can, but, you know, gel spun for some patterns will roll off of itself. It slides. It's really, really slippery stuff and it won't build a dam up the way you want it. There are patterns where that's an exception. Um, you'll notice when we did our war pig, uh, Justin Hokinson um, uses uh, gel spun for that pattern and, you know, cool. So I mean, it's pretty easy to see. We're building up a pretty generous thread dam here and controlling the taper and achieving what we're after profile wise, but it's going to be I'm trying to think if we're going to do one more tie in or, or exactly what we're going to do here. So if you give me a sec. So yeah, at this point, we've got a nice taper, like our, our bucktail kind of has, it's hard to see it in the video. I'm going to try to help, but you've got this nice kind of rounded profile um, with your feathers. We'll go ahead and take and measure and get these feathers to length that we want them, which is just a little bit shorter than the ones before them. So just for reference, what we're after lengthwise here, we're just, you know, we're just trying to go a little shorter than the previous set of feathers was, um, just so that in the water, these aren't, you know, just lined up. There's kind of a natural texture and, and taper to them. And we're gonna do the same thing here that we did on the last step, which is we're gonna take those vertical stems and we're going to smush them with our scissors. And sometimes when you do this, your feather won't want to cooperate. These ones are being nice and cooperative, but sometimes your feather will rotate when you go to compress these. And you just need to take an extra second and to get them the way you want. See that rotated right there? And it wasn't quite what I was after. There we go. So, And I won't always do this, but you know, as I'm starting to move up on a fly and you start to run out of room on the shank, sometimes it makes sense just in preserving shank space to tie up on your thread dam. Uh, and it's you want to be cautious because th this thread is more prone to slipping down that thread dam forward. But um, again, we're going to tent our feathers here. And I'm actually going to tie a second set of pectoral fin feathers right over the top of this, but I'll do these side feathers first. So it looks, this taper looks a little sharper than it actually is because there you go. 
you'll notice some of the, the bucktail is hiding up there, but you see that we're kind of building out that belly as we move forward. And then when we wrap our marabou, uh, it's gonna kind of complete the rest of that taper. But what we're gonna do, and I'm between yellow and red eyes. Uh, let's go yellow eyes on this one. And let's not forget our pectoral fins. So pectoral feathers, uh, the difference between these and the last tie in we did is that these ones get quite a bit shorter. So these are, these will end up being less than half as long as the third set of tail feathers that we just put in. Um, and these are not um, necessary. Like if you're somebody who's like, you know, it's 1 30 in the morning and I am fishing tomorrow morning and you know, I, I don't have time to, you know, put on another set of feathers, then that's fine. Like you don't have to do it. I like to do kind of every and anything in our power to, you know, hopefully attain an edge on the water in our tying. You know, I was just mentioning how sometimes your feathers will want to rotate and we're getting that right now. And you just got to bear with it for a second. You'll get it to, you'll get it to settle in. So again, we'll come back in here with our super glue, just to give this a little bit of extra love. And those aren't going anywhere. They probably wouldn't go anywhere if I didn't put super glue on them, but they're definitely not now. And I am actually going to try, not even going to try, we're going to, we're going to eke one more section of bucktail on here before our marabou. Um, don't have to, if we wanted to do marabou right now, we definitely could, um, but I don't want to. And if you're tying a river pig for the first time, or you know, you've tied maybe a couple in the past and, and you're just trying to become better at tying the pattern, uh, just thinking about space on the shank as you're tying will make you a better tire. Uh, the, you know, I've gone back and forth a little bit. Am I gonna do three or four wraps on this? And part of that is, Part of that is deciding whether or not we want a you know sparser version of this pattern or not. I have a general idea of the type of water um, that this fly is going to be fished in. It's for a customer and in their area. So conditions there are not always the calmest. So we're going to give them a little extra material um, before we get all the way into um, the marabou wraps. And, and that's so we got one more one more reverse tie in here. Um, And this last tie in a bucktail will be a little bit shorter again than the previous section. 
uh, in, in achieving the, the profile that we're after. And, and when we're done, we will uh, we'll share a, a picture of this fly just without questionable video light so that you can see a little bit better. And I'm, I'm happy that we're doing this. Um, part of the thought here is that there will be times where you're in between how much space you have on the shank and, and what's best to do in that situation. And you're gonna get an example to see that right here. Uh, we are nearly out of shank space on this fly. And if I try to tie the thread dam right now all the way, there probably won't be room to, um, to tie the eyes on without them trying to, you know, go onto the front of the shank, which is not what you're after. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll do a partial thread dam, just enough to hold that material back. And then I'll tie my eyes on, get them where I want them, lock them in. And then I'll finish tying my thread dam to really dial in that taper that, that we're after. What I'll do is I'll use crystal flash after this thread dam, after we do eyes. Anyway, we'll get into all that. And if you see me using my fingers to kind of push where the bucktail is tied in, um, sometimes when we're tying and we're, you know, just thinking or, or whatever, but when we cinch everything down, sometimes our thread dam or our, our tie-in is at an angle. And when you see me fudging with my fingers, the purpose of that is to get that material all in a nice even circle so that when I'm doing my thread dam, I get that nice even taper all the way around. If, if maybe you have, you know, if you haven't done this before, maybe you'll have more material on one side and as you try to do your thread dam, you'll notice that one side doesn't want to lay down the way you want it to. Um, and, and so sometimes this technique will help you there. Other times that tie-in will be at an angle and you're just, you know, using those fingers to get everything in a nice uh, concentric circle before you really finish doing your thread dam. So I'm just about at the point where I'm going to advance my thread just enough to get our eyes tied in. So you'll notice that this taper isn't perfect. It's still a little bit more open than, than I'm after. And that's okay, because we're going to fix that. Um, but we are going to get these eyes tied in first. And again, you'll notice that we're on the underside, the flat part of the shank. We don't really want our eyes to go on the front here. Um, and, and that's just a tying theory thing becomes a little bit more difficult to anchor your eyes and to know that things aren't going to move if you let them rotate onto the front of the shank. So now, if you wanted, you know, to maybe build up a little bit more thread dam, you can. Um, I'm not quite done tying the eyes all the way in, but it is nice, one, to get it out of your way while you're tying in, and two, to be able to picture, you know, how your fly is going to end up a little bit better. So I like to go in and make sure that my eyes are squared up, you know, in a nice 90 degree angle to that, that front part of the shank. Um, and if you see... You know, sometimes they're cockeyed, and if you have them that way, maybe it will, maybe it'll favor a side on the action when you swim. Maybe the file just want to kick to one side. And sometimes in rivers, that's unavoidable if the current's strong enough. The the fly is usually going to go that one way. But um, you know, say this is a fly that you either want to fish in still water, or maybe the current's really weak. If you do take the extra effort to keep things uh, even 
you have a much better chance of having a fly that does walk the dog when you want it to. Um, and that's not to say that when you're fishing it, you want it to do this rhythmic thing, because when you do that, you'll, you'll hypnotize a muskie. Um, if you get a follow, uh, and you're just, you know, really focused on swimming that fly, nice, even cadence. A lot of times you'll have that fish follow it because they're curious and you have their interest, but it's when you get into the erratic stuff and maybe, you, you know, twitch it extra and, and get a little more aggressive with your retrieve. Um, that seems to be when these fish want to eat. Cause think about it. I mean, what fish is like, Oh, there's, there's a shark behind me. I'm just going to kind of putter left and putter right. Like that's unnatural to the fish. And, and even though they're interested, you might not actually trigger them into eating in that scenario. So um, really focus on, you know, a good erratic retrieve. Uh, Luke Swanson has an article in, I want to say maybe the June, is it May, June or June, July issue of uh, Muskie Hunter magazine last year. And uh, he, he talks about his technique for not wanting that, um, not wanting that rhythmic retrieve and why that's a bad thing or maybe less than ideal thing. So this is pretty close to locked in. Um, I will do one more, maybe two more. And I am counting wraps there to try to keep things even. So those eyes are not going anywhere. Um, any guesses what we're going to do? We can do super glue. I also really like uh, hard as whole head cement. Um, it penetrates the wraps a little bit better. Um, and if you have had some of this stuff for a while, they also have a, uh, a thinner because it gets a little bit clumpy sometimes or, or goopy. It'll, it'll start to cure over time just from opening the bottle. Um, but I, I'm pretty liberal with that stuff. Uh, let it soak into your thread wraps and, and that'll help your eyes stay where they're going to be. Um, when we're done with this fly, I will also coat all of that one more time with, uh, with UV thin uh, and, and lock that in, whether that's Loon or, or Solaris, you know, it really is just personal preference at that point. Um, so now I know these eyes aren't going to move anymore and I want to focus on finishing my taper. Um, so I'm just going back in here and locking all of that down. And you'll notice it, we talked about, you know, sometimes when you do this, you'll have a little more material on one side, maybe, um, maybe it didn't spin perfectly. Sometimes, um, sometimes we're at an angle. And if that happens, or sometimes when we're doing our thread dam, maybe we'll not have realized it and been at an angle. Um, and you just take your time and, you know, all, all what I'll do is I'll now tie this angle at this, just to push this one side down just a little bit more. And, uh, You'll notice in just a second that that ends up just the way we want it. And so I'm really happy with the shape of this fly. Um, the lighting makes it look, it really shows off the illusion of bulk well. Because if you're looking at me, you know, this looks like a, a pretty sparse fly. Um, but at the same time, it has a, a good profile. And that's just a question of lighting. When I take a picture of this, this will look much bulkier and have much more of a, a natural profile to it. So before we tie our last step, our, our marabou in, I'm going to just really get specific about what I'm after on this taper. And that's because I'm still standing up a little more than I want. And this is a pretty stiff round bucktail. Um, some, some tails have more hollow to them than others. And this one falls in that category. Um, so I'm happy with that now, but before we get into our marigou, I'm going to put in some brown crystal flash and just recapping while we're, we're pulling flash out here, contrast profile, and then, um, fundamentals just in terms of, you know, going from sparser to more dense, uh, you'll notice we started with, a, our, our light first tie in of feathers, but then we went straight to dark and then we have, you know, a grizzly ish barred feather over the top of that to Cree feather. Um, and what that results in is even on, you know, a relatively straightforward sucker pattern, 
we end up getting these different layers of complexity. So whether that's contrast between the feather colors or the texture or thicker feathers and thin feathers, um, different colors, uh, it's all kind of, you're building in layers and that complexity is, in my opinion, and I think more than my opinion, what we look at and say, oh, that's a really fishy fly. Um, that's a complex fly. And, and usually it's been layered and, and built out that way on purpose. So I'm only using six or seven. I've actually taken a couple more than I meant to. Six or seven pieces of crystal flash um, for this last tie-in. Uh, when I started tying, my reflex would have been to use 10 or 12 strands. And when you double that over and it becomes 20 strands, that is too much. And, and I'm tapering my, my flash in line with shortening my bucktail the rest of the way. So I start by measuring with length. I fold it over so I know how long I want it. But the same thing with our flash this time where kind of loosely open my grip up as I pull that you end up with these feathered ends where not everything is aligned. Um, and when I fold them over my thread like this, if one side is longer, it's gonna be the side that's towards the front of the fly because when you tie it in like this, it actually flips. And so your, your flash does the same longer to shorter taper as you've been working on for the rest of the fly. And you'll notice as you time more and more, just trying to verbalize different things of what you're trying to do and talking about, you know, tying techniques or theory, or what about this? And how do I do this thing that I'm trying to accomplish? Don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions or talk with your friends uh, so that you grow as a, a tire and as an angler because they really do go together. Like when I'm sitting at the vise, I'm not just tying. I am thinking about how this fly is gonna swim, um, how it's gonna work when I pause it so that when I actually do go on the water and I fish this thing, I've thought about a lot of this already, um, and, and I feel like that's one of the things that makes you grow as an angler. So this last step, uh, we got our last tie in a flash in here. The last step is palmering our marabou in. And uh, we're just about done before we do our UV. But we're just about done. The way we do that is you kind of go towards the tip. You're going to tie in at the tip of your feather. And I like to go where the feather just starts to lengthen, um, where the fibers start to get a little more consistent in length. And I will actually go in and I will pinch. I try to get even, but it, again, you don't have to. Um, I think it just depends how strong your OCD is. Um, but when you get it close to where you want it, you're gonna leave just a little bit there. And you're gonna leave yourself this little triangle to tie in. You notice I got that little, uh, little bit right and just show that a little better, but we're gonna tie in right at that little stem point right there before we palmer. And we're tying in as far close to that flash as we can without affecting our taper and our thread dam. And we will palmer this forward. So I'm gonna do, um, so I'm doing six or seven wraps. Um, five or six at the tie-in, but part of my extra wraps here is covering the extra fibers there. And, and again, it, this is overkill. So, you, you know, you're able to let yourself just leave it a little easier. Um, you don't have to cover that because you're going to wrap back over it now. But um, so now you're going to take those fibers and you're going to hold them back as you wrap the stem um, around and slowly work your way forward. You're not tying the stem back on top of itself. You are holding those fibers back and then you're just slowly working your way forward. And I will usually do three wraps here and it's looking like that is gonna be the case here too. And again, the reason we're holding these fibers back like this is because we don't 
what ends up happening if we don't is sometimes you'll trap fibers. And if you do trap fibers, you can go ahead and take your bodkin or needle or, or whatever you use as a pokey. Um, and you can go back in and you can pick those fibers out. But um, I'm a little more particular once I lock everything in because if you wrap your thread over the stem and the fibers, you're going to impact your profile. What I do is when I lock the stem in, and this is a spot where this is a spot where I'm actually going to take a picture of it afterward. But my wraps on the top of the fly, especially, um, are in front of the stem, not behind it. Um, and I'm going to try to overlay a, a graphic in here when, when this airs so that folks can see what I'm referring to. So I'll just take a quick picture. Perfect. And we will make it clear what I am trying to describe. And so once I get everything tied in the way I want, and usually I do like to do three tie-ins uh, on this particular Palmer, because if I've, do I've done two before, and what will happen is sometimes that when I cut this stem of this marabou, that fiber will um, want to slide. And it just, this way I know that it's going to stay right where we want it. So again, that thread wrap is going to go in front of, and actually I can show it this way. So the stem of the feather is right here. If I tied between the stem and the bases of the feather fibers, um, I would be cinching that down and it might not be, you know, I'm sure it'd be just as flowy, but it would bother me. So what I like to do is advance my thread forward on the top of the fly. So that's, you know, those feathers, you, there's nothing impeding the, from the stem where we wrap to the base of the feathers. Um, and then I'll just capture the very end of that feather. And we'll just do a, a couple more wraps. And when I'm happy with everything there, and we are, um, I like to hand whip. Um, you know, if you have a, a whip finishing tool and that's something that you prefer, uh, you can do that. Or if you Google hand whip finish, like there's plenty of videos that will show you, but um, I don't really use a tool anymore. So you just kind of bring your fingers, you get your whip loop, hold your fibers out of the way. And we just tie everything down. And I'm sure it would be fine right there, but I, if I have room, I like to do a couple of finishes. And yeah, that fly, the tying portion of it is complete. And it's time for more overkill. So, you know, the thing I've noticed with this fly, especially starting off, is that your eyes may want to rotate. And, you know, that fly that I showed you before that has caught a lot of fish, um, you know, super gluing it the night, you know, multiple nights in a row because you didn't want to call it quits on that. Um, you know, that that's a fly I tied a long time ago. Uh, but as your technique improves, knowing that your eyes aren't going to rotate is one of the places where you're going to be really happy that a fly still fishes the way is, you know, it has for a long time. So yeah, this is the river pig. Uh, we're just about done there. I'm letting the um, letting that hardest hole dry and it dries pretty quickly. Um, I'm looking for my brown marker. If I didn't do this, I'm actually just going to color my white thread and give it a little bit dark top. It would make no difference. It might increase visibility. Um, again, if I'm trying to tie something that is on the realistic side, then 
you know, you can get as nitty with it as you want to, or, you know, if you want to err towards guide fly, say for instance, you don't have, um, say you don't have eyes, you can do lead wraps or, you know, if you have channel lead or, you know, some other, maybe you have CI as the aluminum version and you want to glue, uh, you know, something holographic to those eyes, you know, for a little more realism, you can do that. If you don't have marabou and you want to use um, emulator flash or you want to use uh, some other material that you have uh, i've used i've done like perch with you know bruiser blend or laser dub because um, i can mark it and give it stripes um, you can do that if you want to tie this fly in all white or all yellow and you want to just, or all black, right? And you want to go fish it, do that. Um, you don't have any grizzly fly, grizzly feathers, doesn't matter. Like, you know, tie it up and fish it. If you want to downsize it, like I've tied this all the way down to four inch versions on a size two hook. And it works really, really well um, for picky stripers that are keyed in on a certain size forage fish. You can do that too. Um, so all this to say, really versatile pattern and one of the last steps that i do again this fly is done like especially if i'm at camp and i don't have maybe i'm out of uv or something like that like you can go fish it um in the spirit of trying to protect the thread and the eyes and, and fishing this in a lot of, of fisheries that have pike and knowing how hard they are um, on flies i like to coat the thread on this last step with thin um clear cure or you know this is the loon thin uv um and i will do this on the top half of the fly like i just did cure it doesn't have to be perfectly done there um, i'll do it on the bottom of the fly as well and just lock all those thread wraps in do the same thing, just cure that there. And yeah, that is the river pig in Sucker. Uh, one of my favorite all around flies. Uh, the Sucker is something that, especially in the Midwest, is a prolific bait fish for uh, everything that swims. And, and that extends all around the country. I mean, there's some type of sucker in most fisheries. Um, if you don't have sucker, maybe you have shad, um, but you know, the illusion of bulk, um, you can comfortably cast this fly on a seven or an eight weight if that was what you wanted to do. Uh, if you're fishing for muskie, again, I'd, I'd recommend a, a 10. And, and you know, there's some people who make a case for an eight, but uh, in the interest of conservation and not fighting a fish until it's exhausted, uh, especially if you're in a, a, a fishery that has larger caliber fish, um, definitely don't go below a 10 weight. Uh, and, but if you are fishing for pike and bass mostly, then feel free to fish with a, a seven or an eight weight. Uh, and if you have some other version of gear and you're like, hey, I don't know, can I do this or can I try that? Uh, reach out, let us know, uh, and please, we'll look forward to your feedback on these videos. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, from me and from us at Muskie Town for all of your support so far. It has been an incredible year. Uh, we're not even at the one-year mark yet, but uh, we've been excited about sharing this series with you. Uh, our next episode is going to be on the Buford, and the one after that is going to be on the Smoker uh, with John Cooper. So, uh, thank you all again for being here and uh, appreciate you tuning in for tying with the pros. Mm -hmm.